Welcome to Wounded for War, featuring the Bible teaching of Phil Santo. This broadcast is an online video teaching through the Bible to help people rethink Jesus and his mission, to seek out the hurt, the lost, and the broken. So grab your favorite drink and a seat and join us as we start today's talk. Hey guys, so today... We are jumping into uh, the first part of our series um, called A Reason for the Season. So we're in, you know, strange times right now, right? And and because we are, everybody's kind of gauging life, re-gauging life, and and kind of asking a lot of questions. Well, I want to ask a simple question, and that question is, uh, what does it look like um, for you to see revival in your life. Well, this series, I believe, has the potential to help you understand that. In Second Chronicles, it talks about, and honestly, it's one of the scriptures that's most famously quoted for revival. It talks about what revival looks like um, in God's people and, and in their hearts and in their land. And, and I'd like to read that And then I want to dive into a subject that we're going to start with from the very beginning. And that is, what is a Christian? Because you're going to see, he says, uh, my people who are called by my name. And we're going to start right there. My people who are called by my name. I think it's important to first identify, are we living a legit Christian life or are we living some version that someone made up and handed to us or or even maybe we made up, right? Um... We often today take faith uh, from kind of a buffet style um, picking, right? It's, uh, well, I kind of like this about uh, the Buddhist religion, and I kind of like this about Christianity, and I kind of like this about uh, the Muslim faith, and I kind of like this about the Mormon faith. And But, but that's not um, being true to any one of those. That's making up your own religion. And so what I want to ask is, Because there are so many different things out there under the banner of Christianity, I'd like to boil it down to see what is a Christian so that we can either know or not, know that we are in or not in this, uh, my people who are called by my name. Am I one of them? And if not, maybe I want to be, maybe I thought I am all my life, um, but maybe I'm not. And so it's a starting ground to understand who you are and who you aren't. So in this section of uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 11 is where we're going to start. I want to read it real quick and just dive in. It's going to be 11 through 14. It says, Thus Solomon had finished the house of the Lord and the king's house, and all that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord. And in his own house, he successfully accomplished When the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Now, quick but noteworthy, he says in here, pestilence, and in other versions it says plague. So we are dealing with a plague currently, and yet he says that if in fact he sends a plague, now, Okay, we could back up just a a second. I know, first question. Wait a second, sounds like God's uh, saying, yeah, I picked that place um, to worship um, uh, as a dwelling place, right? This place that he had built. It's kind of our version of modern day church. And and then he, he, it's like he switches immediately and just goes to straight, hey, if, by the way, if I, if I go ahead and, and harm my people who are called by my name, um, then if you do these things, then I'll heal your land. So he's just kind of like a father in this moment, kind of laying out in, in, a, in a fashion we're maybe not used to because it was written 2,000 years ago. But let me simplify this for you. It's a dad in that moment where you say, hey, look, 
um, I've chosen for you and I to be family, but I also want you to understand that I'm, I'm a dad and I know you're not going to obey me a hundred percent. So I'm going to assume some things in this and, and because you're not going to be obedient at times, I'm going to have to send some things your way that are not so pleasant. It's called discipline. But that discipline is not meant to break you and, and hurt you and harm you. Ultimately, ultimately it's actually to draw you back. It's actually to draw you to a place where he can heal the land and forgive their sin. So this is a dad simply stating, you're mine, but I'm going to have to correct you sometimes. And if you do these things, it will lead to your benefit. Now, I know you want to jump right into the list of do's and don'ts because we are a society built on getting it done, right? And, and that's great. But before we go there, it might be interesting to know, am I adopted in? Am I part of the group? Or am I not? So, since it's so convoluted as to what a Christian is, I thought we'd take a little time and, and dive in. So, I want you to take a look real quick at, at, uh, at what a Christian is. What is a Christian? Well, in James chapter 2, 14 through 16, I think we're going to have our, our start right there. Because in that section, uh, we as uh, Christians are also known as people of faith, right? I had a guy at work uh, recently come into my office and, and talk to me about uh, my, he was asking me about my son's uh, cancer or uh, his tumor that was removed. But at the same token, um, he, he didn't know that my wife actually uh, had just been uh, diagnosed with a tumor and that she's getting it out this Friday. So he goes, yeah, 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 uh, man, that's, that's really gnarly, but, but your faith, right? Um, that's what's, it's good that you have faith because it's going to get you through. But, but you see faith in and of itself, just trust in and of itself means nothing. You have to trust in something that's worth trusting in. So faith with, which is just another word for trust, my trust in this chair that I'm sitting in, I'm testing it, right? I'm making sure I'm testing whether I can trust it. Well, in the case of faith for Christians, we're trusting in Jesus Christ and the work in which he did, right? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, which defeated the enemy, Satan, and, and actually gave me the ability to have new life. And so therefore, I'm having to trust or have faith in this thing that happened over 2,000 years ago. So that's what identifies me as this faith. So is, is this faith um, just a, a, a blanket trust? Well, let's take a look. It says in James 2, 14 through 17, what good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith? but does not have works, can that faith save him? Pause. The question is, can faith that actually doesn't lead you to move or do anything or say, live, live differently, say things that are differently, if it doesn't change you, then really is it any good? Is it worth anything? Probably not, it seems. Can it save him if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food? And one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and filled without giving them the things they need for the body. What good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So right off the bat, our faith in Jesus Christ should compel us to movement. Not just idle, sitting by, living my own life, my best way, until Jesus returns. And then I'm like, oh yeah, and that thing about you coming back, cool, I get to go to heaven. That's not it. He's saying that if you're adopted into this new family and you are called by his name, you're also called 
to be an ambassador. There's other areas in the scriptures that talk about us being an ambassador, someone who represents the one that we are to follow. So that's Jesus. So if Jesus is the one that I am called by his name, then I ought to look like him. And if my faith and trust in him is real, then it means that I would actually do something that resembles. It's interesting. What does he, what does he say? He likens faith that's real to charity, to loving other people, to caring for their needs, right? He says, hey, if this brother or sister doesn't have anything to eat or food or, or shelter or clothing, man, and you just say, hey, dude, I'll be praying for you. I hope everything goes well. Right on, man. You know, Jesus is good, but you don't do anything? What good is that? That's not even a real faith. It's not even, definitely not even going to save you. So faith is not um, something that we earn. We don't earn a position. So we're not working for our faith, but we work from our faith. You see, if I trust in him and I believe in him and he tells me that he's going to give me power to live a new life, then I'm going to do that. I'm going to lean in. I'm going to try that. And I'm going to see him come back at me with power to do so. Well, so faith has some works. Faith actually motivates us to live a certain way, right? Well, what does that look like? Well, let's take a look at Romans 8, uh, 5 through 11. Romans 8, 5 through 11. Let's dive over there real quick and see what that has to say about faith. What does it look like? It's chapter 8, verse 5. Starting there, it says... For those who live according to the flesh set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind, set, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Here's the contrast. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the spirit of God does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, Although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. So, what does it look like? It looks like someone that is led by the spirit. Notice, he says, if you walk according to the flesh, those are desires, the desires of our own heart. If we, if we, Pursue the things that our own heart wants. Wow, that girl looks good. Or, you know, if I just cheat on my career here or my taxes there, I can get ahead and I can, you know, move to the next level and level up. But the reality is, is he says, hey, um, if you're pursuing your own desires, you're probably going to be led to death. But if you're led by the Spirit, I know, the Spirit, controversial subject, right? It's just the third person in the Trinity. It's a, it's a person of God that he left behind as a deposit to deposit in the heart and life of the believer. So there's literally for the believer in Jesus Christ who has faith in him, there is a, another person dwelling within us who walks and talks and, and interacts, but within our being, right? So now it's not my own desires that are leading me through life. I'm actually communicating and having this conversation with the Lord through the Holy Spirit within me and asking, Lord, what's on your heart? I'd like you to, to set my mind on the things that are of you, on the things that bring life. It says, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. So, what does it look like to be spirit-led? Set your mind on the things of the spirit, 
focus, fix your eyes on, uh, spend your time, your energy, your resources seeking out the things of the Spirit. You know, um, the Lord said it best this way. He says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all else will be added. You don't even need to worry about the other stuff. He's got your back. So it's a life of pursuit. That's what it looks like. It's a pursuing of the things that are of the Lord and not of the this world. Okay? So that seems like everyone's going in a direction. That's not all that great. It doesn't seem like it's something that I would want to do because uh, it seems awfully lonely and uh, I don't know if it's worth it. Well, what does it produce? Maybe that's a question that needs to be answered then. What does it produce in the life? Romans 8, 11, the very next verse actually kind of lays that out for us. Um, if peace in life is not enough, it says, if the spirit of him who dwell, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give life to what? to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So it's not just this spiritual pursuit that um, really leads to just this kind of like, okay, utopian, om, om, I have this inner peace and, and that's great. No, he actually says that he's gonna bring life to your what? Mortal bodies. What he's referring to there is, that the here and now, your life that you wanted to pursue, but but you realize that pursuing spiritual things of Jesus Christ were better. Well, it's because he's going to actually give you a new life here and now too. It's not just some future thing that we're banking. It's not fire insurance. Jesus Christ is not fire insurance for later. It's for a new life here and now. It's for giving life to your mortal body, to your 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 daily life. It's he's got a different plan for you. It's going to produce a, a fruit. He calls it a fruit in the, in the scriptures and other places. Fruit seems good, especially when you're hungry, right? Well, we're all hungry right now. We're all hungry for a new life. We're all hungry for a new way. So my question is, if you're in the moment right now and you're watching this video, is the life and the pursuits that you are, are going after, are they worth it? Are they bearing fruit and is it any good? If not, I'm going to invite you in a few minutes to, to try a new path, to try Jesus's path, to literally become a part of the family and to, to be not just a part of the family, but to pursue the things that are spiritual and not just earthly. I know. There are some people out there though right now saying, I, I went that way as a young kid and it didn't do anything. And, and maybe, you know, your pursuits weren't legitimate. I don't know. I don't know. But what I do know is this, there's a lot of people out there that um, walked away from the church and they're not sure if there's anything in it for them or they feel like, well, if I fell away once, well, maybe I'll fall away again. Or maybe you're out there and you're thinking, no, there can't be a God with all this garbage going on. And I have nothing but sorrows. There can't be a good God. Well, I'd like you to, to take a look at how you remain as a Christian. And not just how you remain, but, um, but what can pull you away. Okay? Let's take a look at Luke 22, verse 42. Okay? Luke 22, verse 42 through 45, it says this, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise, 
pray that you might not enter into temptation. So, why do I bring this scripture up? Because here we find Jesus in his most weak moment. What does it say about him? Maybe you can relate in the moment. It says that he was in agony. That he was fervently praying. He's not experiencing a, his best life now. He's, he's struggling. He, it's, it sucks. But what did he say? He said, but nevertheless, your will be done. What's that? That's pursuing spiritual things, right? So he's in the moment. He's, he's being legit. He's, we're watching him be an example for us as to what Christianity looks like. Because he's the one we follow. And it's in one of his darkest hours. How, how dark? Dude, he's sweating drops of blood. I, I've had a lot of sorrow in my life, but I got to be honest with you. I've never been to the point where I'm sweating great drops of blood. Now, He's that hard pressed. But what do we see in this moment? And there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. So we know right off the bat when we're at that point, that breaking point, God will send help. That's what he did for him. And there's many other stories of, of God sending someone to help in that very time of need, right? And, and what happens out of that? It's just in being in great agony, he prayed. He had these great, you know, drops of, of blood, right? What does he do then? He says, and he rose from prayer. He came to his disciples. What does it say about them? And found them sleeping for sorrow. Okay. Listen, I had never seen, I, I'd seen it, but I hadn't caught it. In all the years that I've been studying the scriptures, they were sleeping for sorrow. In other words, their hard life, their rough circumstances, it just crushed them. You ever been there? You ever been so devastated that all oh, you, you just want to sleep? Dude, just I just want it to end and I'm not going to end my life. Therefore, I'm just going to go sleep. I just hope it all, I wake up and it's all gone. That's how, how depressed these guys were. They're literally just, they're saying, hey, I, I can't even handle it anymore. I, I just need to go to sleep. But when we're in this craziness right now, I know that's the temptation. Or maybe in a time and season in your life when you were walking with the Lord, things were good, but things got bad. And you said, the sorrows, God's not here. I'm just going to go take a spiritual nap and go see what the world has. Notice, even when they fell asleep for sorrows, they were brokenhearted. Notice his, his statement to them. He comes back with, why are you sleeping? Rise invitation language there, by the way, rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. That's the invitation that I would give for you and I today. Man, notice the very next thing that it said for revival. My people who are called by my name, if what? If they prayed and seek my face. We're going to jump into that uh, the, the, the section about prayer and what that means. But, but be, I really want you to, to, to think about that for a moment. If my people were called by my name, pray. It means that you're going to have to have some faith again. It means you're going to have to lay back, lay, lay back down some of those sorrows that you had in the past, or maybe even having now and, and, and trust again in a way that it moves you to action. Lord, Help me, right, to move forward into trusting you. You know, there's a fruit that'll come about. It's a changed life. Transformed life. And it's a 
every day leaning in because every day something's going to come against you and try and knock you down, knock you out, bring sorrows to a level where you end up on the sidelines. But I would invite you back into the, into the battle. Because even if your drops of blood are being sweat out, God will send angels to minister to you. If you wait upon him, and you trust in him. So I'd like to end today with a prayer. With praying for you. That God would move you to trust him again. Put your faith back into him in a way that moves you. Father, this has got to be for somebody out there that you really want to reach. And I know because I had one hell of a time getting this message put together. There was so much war and battle in just getting to this point. So Lord, whoever it is that watches this, that needed to hear this message, Lord, I beg of you that you would soften their hearts, Lord, that you would give them a desire to come back to you. Lord, your words in the Bible declare that you woo, you draw gently in those that you're seeking to follow you. This world's been brutal. And I pray, Lord, that whoever it is that needs to hear this message, Lord, that they would see you maybe for the first time, maybe even um, see you in a new light, Lord. Not the one that someone painted a picture of you, but Lord, that you would reveal yourself as loving, kind, and a God who invites people in, even if they've been spiritually asleep. Lord, I thank you. And I praise you for what you'll do in their life. I pray that, Lord, you would give them a heart just to cry out to you. And just, Lord, that you would show up in a way that would reveal yourself as so legitimately real and tangible and loving and caring and as a good father. I thank you. I praise you. And I ask all of this in Jesus' name and by your authority, Lord. Amen. Thank you for watching Wounded for War. If this video has touched your heart, I would like to encourage you to hit the like or subscribe button so that you get our weekly videos for more encouragement. Also, feel free to share this with a friend if you think that this could encourage them. You can leave a comment at the bottom uh, so that we can reach out to you if you have any needs as well. See you next time at Wounded for War.